we go. All right, so my name is Amy Martinez. I will be your classroom instructor for both LPV and 120 and in yours 202. For some of you, I will be your clinical instructor as well. I'll be doing Chip and Ham pediatrics on Saturdays. So if you're doing Saturday clinicals, you'll probably have me as well. Um, I know is going to be Miss Short on Fridays, and I think some of the Saturdays is Miss Short. I don't know about peds on Friday. I haven't heard yet. Um, so um, as far as PNs, um, typically y'all go to for your OB clinical, um, which is a fantastic experience. You go for like a weekend to do your two days together. Um, and because it's a teaching hospital, they're, they're pretty fantastic. Um, I don't know when that'll be. Um, and pediatrics, I don't know right now because normally, um, and that's where we have issues with Friday. Uh, for ADNs is normally we go to Cumberland Hospital. Um, Cumberland Hospital with the increase in numbers right now is not letting us come um, for the last, I don't know, I think they shut down the students a couple weeks before the end of the last semester. So, and they haven't opened back up yet. So we'll see what that entails. Who knows, that may change. Thank you. Um, but that's what I have right now. So um, either your clinicals, if you're ADN or Friday or Saturday for PNs, I don't know. <laughs> um, generally, your OB will be over a weekend, like one, week, one full weekend, because you get two OB days and two PEDS days. All right, so I will warn you, there's a lot of information in both of these classes. Um, but I try to give you everything I can to help you prepare. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through my Blackboard course because there is a lot. And that's where this first sheet comes into, the one that's on the front and it's a neon for a purpose. I have a lot of stuff I load in my class that are not always things that are required. So a lot of it's just extra resources for you. Because everybody learns in different ways. So this gives you different opportunities to have different um, assignments that you can do. So if you're ever wondering, where do I find in her Blackboard course, because she's got 50 million things loaded in it, here's the outline, so you can find, oh, where are the ATI cut scores? Because I'm taking my ATI test tomorrow and I want to know what I need. This will tell you where to find it. So use a sheet um, that will help you to locate things within the course. And I'm going to show you, I did load one of my courses, so that way I can show you where everything is located. On the back of that same sheet, just some tips for success, um, some sites that may be helpful. For example, um, Kathy Parks, a lot of people like her. She's pretty great. So is Registered Nurse RN. I love her accent. What can I say? But she's got some good videos as well. Um, things like nursing.com and um, there is an, an ATI app. So those are some extra things that can help you um, be more successful in, in what you have. The other two pages that you have, um, the middle page right here is, um, is uh, your checkoff sheet. Well, Y'all gave that to Miss Roos, and if you haven't, write your name on it. Send it up to her. She's going to sign it off, and ladies that are on Skype with me, I will email that to you all so you all have it. Um, this just shows that you were here and you did it. And then the last sheet is another sheet I'm going to end up needing you to upload to your to your uh, clinical course once you have it available. And ladies on Skype, I will send this to you as well. It's an emergency contact sheet. Um, so this is something you'll upload to Blackboard that only instructors will have access to. It's not going to be where everybody else can see it. That's why we have you upload it with emergency contact information. This is a in case there was an emergency at clinical and we needed to contact your next of kin, we could do it pretty quickly. Um, there was an incident a while ago where um, somebody had a medical emergency at clinical. Um, clinical instructor, of course, did not have access to Banner because Banner is limited based on teaching the classes, so they had to contact Ms. Eric. The contact phone number in Banner was wrong, so it took them like an hour to get a hold of next of kin because of factors. So this gives us quick and easy, who do you want us to call if by chance, God forbid, there was a medical emergency at clinical and we needed to call somebody. So this lists up to three people. It doesn't have to be three if you want to list three, but at least one person and their phone number of who we would contact. And then at the bottom, voluntarily, you don't have to. Put any medical information that might be important if it was an emergency. For example, if you have a seizure disorder, that might be good to know if, if we were at clinical and we might need to know that. Or if you have diabetes and you are having a hypoglycemic episode, something like that. You don't have to, um, but that can help us too if we need to know that you have some kind of medical problem. 
that might present an emergency situation. Um, most of your stuff this semester, um, I will not be printing out. You will need to print yourself because COVID. Um, so uh, we, we won't be printing a lot. Your PowerPoints, normally I always printed them before, but with everything going on, you'll need to either print them yourself or bringing your, your computer to class, you'll have that as well to be able to view the PowerPoints and even type right into them. Um, Clinical paperwork. So you'll have like your evaluation, depending on the clinical day, um, like in pediatrics, there's a packet we use um, to fill out on your patient. There's a report sheet. There's, and I will have this loaded into your clinical course. Don't worry. Um, you're going to need to print those before you come to clinical, your eval and all that kind of stuff. Um, so make sure you have those printed when you come. Um, as far as clinical, I'll give you information next week um, as far as like parking and um, food and, and all that, you know, extra information that you need um, for how to get around and get to clinical and, and where to go and stuff like that. Let's see. So lab and clinical guidelines, it's the same ones that are always in your supplemental syllabus. Read your supplemental syllabus. I cannot stress this enough. I don't know how many times people will tell me I didn't know when you sign that signed supplemental syllabus form saying, I read the supplemental syllabus, you're at it. So make sure you read it so you have the information. I'm just, I'm not going to go over all this because hopefully by now y'all have been here long enough to dress and act, right? I'll just tell you about a few of the changes. Um, early changes, but more put in writing. One thing that's always been a policy, but we've had some issues with lately is people sending emails um, from outside email addresses, non Bryant Stratton email addresses. You can only send email to us through a Bryant Stratton email address. And it's not because we're being that picky. It's because a lot of times emails that come from external sources get quarantined. Um, so we may not get your email for a week or more um, because it's being held. So send emails through a Bryant and Stratton email address. Do not send it from your personal email um, because we may not get it. Um, kind of going with that as well, um, and I know y'all did this last semester, but just a reminder, when you go to clinical, make sure y'all are doing your COVID tracker every day. Y'all remember how to do that um, on the app or either on the, um, on the covidtracker.org. Make sure you're doing that every day, um, but on clinical days, you need to send it to your clinical instructor at least one hour before. And again, I will give you a list of who that needs to be on those days you're going to clinical, so you're aware. Um, but make sure you're doing that every day. But when you have clinical days, you need to send it to your clinical instructor at least an hour before. So we know, yes, you're green, you're good, you can attend clinical. Um, and that needs to come through, of course, a Bryant Strand email address. Let's see. So y'all know about the head to toe assessments. Um, y'all did those in med surge. Um, we will do those in pediatrics as well. There will be a head, there will be two head to toe um, check all forms that um, that you'll need. There'll be a pediatric one, and then there'll be a maternity one. Depending on how it goes, you may do end up doing one of each or two peds or, or however you know clinical may be up in the air. It may have to be recorded if we have to leave clinical. We'll see, but ideally, hopefully, we'll be able to do those in the hospital. Um, Again, I will have those forms. Um, actually, I'm going to email them to y'all tonight so you can see them before they get uploaded so you can familiar, familiarize yourself with them. The Patrick's one, for the most part, is going to be very, very similar to your adult one. Um, some of the things that are added, for example, looking at growth and development. That's one of the big things we do in peds versus adults. We're looking at, you know, are they walking? Are they talking? Are they getting their teeth in? That kind of stuff. Uh, for maternity, and we're going to go over a postpartum assessment in a second, the key components of it. A lot of it, the assessment is going to be the same. Um, there's a few key components that are extra. And that's why we do an OB orientation, because we were having students going to OB, and they were lost um, when they would get there, especially with things like finding a fundus. They didn't even know what a fundus was, and that's pretty important in maternity. So um, it's today is more just an overview. Don't worry, there's no test today. Um, not yet, anyway. Uh, but this will, that way, when you go to OB Clinical, you're at least slightly familiar with where to find the fundus, even if you've never found one for, before, for example. 
you at least are trying to look for one up here or something. Um, let's see. Oh, for clinical eval. So just like we did last semester, you will be uploading your clinical evaluations. So you'll get them in clinical, they'll be filled out, and then you'll upload them to Blackboard. Um, but the, the change is, is that they have to be uploaded by midnight that day you did clinical. So when you go home, picture, upload it to Blackboard. So you don't forget about it either. Um, if it doesn't get uploaded by midnight, you don't get credit for hours that day. It's just like when you do a timesheet. If you don't do your timesheet, what happens to the hours you work that day? You get paid, right? So at the end of the day, you'll need to upload your, your daily evaluation so that way it's there um, and we can give you credit for your hours. Sorry? On a paper? Yeah, it should, you'll print it out and bring it to clinical and then we'll fill it out and give you the paper back. Yes, ma'am. Let's see. Sorry? Like how long? Oh, for y so great question. So for PNs, you have four clinical days. You'll do two OB days two pediatric days. For ADNs, y'all have eight. So y'all do four OB and then four pediatrics. Four total that y'all will do. Clutch, and of course, 12 hours. Talked about the tracker. I know this, but I feel like I have to say it every semester. Do not bring your cell phones to clinical. Period. End of story. Uh, now, when I, when, if there is extraneous circumstances, you have a sick kid, you know somebody in the hospital, something like that. However, the way you handle this is when you arrive at clinical, you hand me your phone and say, Miss Martinez, I have an emergency at home. Can you hold on to my phone for me for the clinical day in case I need it? Sure. As long as you do that at the beginning of clinical and not when you get caught three hours later. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I don't know, Norfolk, I think they do have a locker room that, um, like where you change for, for L&D, but um, we usually, you shouldn't re really bring anything to clinical with you um, other than like what you need, like your stethoscope, paperwork, and things like that. So it's just going to depend on the site. Some sites have break rooms. Um, like, for example, when we go to Cumberland, there's really nowhere to put anything. So we leave everything in the car. Basically, if it doesn't fit in your pocket, it doesn't go in the facility with you. Um, let's see. And I know you all know this, uniform compliance. Um, as far as class and clinical, you're always expected to be in uniform. Make sure anytime you're coming to campus, so you're in uniform as well, like the testing center, for example, sometimes people don't realize, so they get there, even when you go to the testing center, you're still supposed to be in uniform. So if you ever come here to take a test in the testing center, make sure you have not only that you're in uniform, that you are, uh, you have your identification as well, because they will check it. After a few weeks, I'll know who you are, so I won't necessarily be checking your ID every time we take a test, but they don't have a clue who you are, possibly, so please check ID. Any questions on that? That was a brief overview. Obviously, the document is far longer, but hopefully most of it y'all know by now. All right, so let's go through this part. If you made it this far with me, congratulations. So we're just going to basically cover some of the, the hot spots, some of the things that when you go to clinical to make sure you know so nobody gets hurt. Um, there will be, and when I go to Blackboard, I'll show you where this is. I'm going to show you several documents I have that are reference documents that you can use for class, take to clinical. Um, I'll have a folder with all those there so that you'll have access to those, and I'll show you where they're at when I go over Blackboard. All right, so here are, uh oh, is it going to work? There. Um, here are some of the skills that we'll be talking about today briefly. Um, fetal heart rate monitoring. Um, right now, I do not expect you to be able to analyze how to a fetal heart rate, for instance, when their heart rate's dropping or, or accelerating or things like that. There's certain ways that it correlates with. Um, with the contractions that you may need to know. So I'll tell you the real and clinical, you need to know this is when you need to get your nurse kind of thing for now. 
we'll talk about when we do labor and delivery in week three, we'll really go into the detailed anal analysis of it. But for right now, this is more just what do you need to know to keep safe. We'll talk about the postpartum assessment because that one's definitely important because you'll have to do a head to toe assessment either in clinical or recorded. Again, depends on, you know, how things work out. Um, so that way you'll know the components. The rest of the assessment is the same. You still listen to heart, lungs, and bowel sounds the same way in a postpartum woman as you do in anything else. But some of the things like checking the fundus, for example, would be new. Um, we'll talk a little bit about postpartum hemorrhage. And again, the things you need to know, the things you need to be observing. And if you see, you need to get the nurse. But when we get to postpartum in week five, we'll really dig into it. Talk about how to draw labs depending on the nurses, depending on what's going on that day that you may or may not be able to draw them yourself. At least you'll kind of know what the process looks like. Um, medications, there's a few meds that all babies get. Um, and how do we give them? How to swaddle? How to give them a bath and important security parameters, like making sure they're not too cold before you give them a bath. And then... We won't really go into the newborn assessment too detailed today because it's pretty detailed, but kind of the big overview, the big things that you see. So fetal heart rate monitoring. Again, I am not going into detail on this today, but I want you to know things that are important for you. If you saw it, what would you need to know? So this top line that you see right here, the fetal heart rate. So that's telling you how fast our heart's beating. Typically, a fetal heart rate should be between 110 and 160. So it's significantly faster than an adult. Uh, and you see that it's not a straight line. It doesn't stay the same number. It's bouncing up and down. It, that's just something we call variability. We'll talk about that later. Um, but that shows baby is awake and responding well if you have that bouncing of the heart rate, not just a straight line. The bottom that you see is the contractions. And you see how this baby's heart rate drops right here with that contraction. Now, I don't expect you at this point to be able to recognize whether it's an early deceleration or a late deceleration, which are two very different things as far as whether it's an emergency or not. Early decelerations means baby's head is getting squeezed because they're getting ready to come out of the birth canal. A late deceleration means they're losing oxygen. You can see the difference of how that would pan out. Um, so basically what I want you to do when you're in L and D, if you see this happen at all, just let your nurse know. If you see that heart rate dip, even if it comes back up, let your nurse know. Cause at this point you're not really going to be able to decipher if it's an early or late D cell. So just let them know if you see any of those dips at all. And I always encourage you anytime you're unsure, let your nurse know, let your clinical instructor know, let somebody know, even if it's just to say, Hey, I'm not sure verify for me because it can absolutely be where you're catching something that they maybe they've missed i had a student um actually it was a pn student um a couple of years ago clinical and she heard the baby go uh, 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 and she was like what is that baby doing and she recognized it that the baby was grunting in pediatrics grunting do y'all know what that means it's respiratory distress so this isn't something you would think of an adult but in a, in a newborn, that is respiratory distress. And she recognized that. And she wasn't sure if it was a problem or not. But by alerting the nurse, she was like, oh, yes, that's a problem. So it's okay to say, I just don't know. Can you tell me? Please. I would rather you speak up and say something than be like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Until it's not fine. Very not fine. So that's just a basic overview. Again, this is something we will go into very much in detail later. In fact, you'll very much hate me for it. Promise. So, the, and these slides will be on in that pre-semester folder as well. So if you are, if you um, miss something, you want to go back and look, that's fine. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, how we analyze the fetal heart rate pattern. I do not want you to memorize this yet. Again, in week three, we will. We will go into this in detail. But when you're looking at what the fetal heart rate is doing, that gives you an idea of um, what the cause is and what you do about it. That deceleration, and that's what it's called. You saw how it came down and then came back up the fetal heart rate. That's called a deceleration. If it's kind of just happening all over the place, that's what we call a variable, for example. So 
something we will talk about later, but that gives you an idea of some of the recommendations to do. The big things you can do as even as a student, if you see something that looks funny, turn the patient on their side. Um, it's not going to hurt them and it may help them depending on what's going on. Like cord compression, for example, you turn her on her side, it may fix the problem. But if that's not the problem and you turn her on her side, it's certainly not going to hurt either. So if you feel like you need to do something, <laughs> turn them on their side. A lot of times that will um, at least possibly do something, but it won't hurt. So one of the big things, postpartum assessment, a acronym you can use to help you remember the components that are specific to the postpartum mom is bubble he. B-U-B-B-L-E-H-E. -E. And we will talk about this a lot. But these are the parts that will help you remember when you're doing that postpartum head to toe assessment. The parts that are extra. The rest of it is going to be the same thing you did in med surge. Um, this is the stuff that is going to be on top of that. So the things that we're looking at in the postpartum woman that are extra, that we're looking at the breasts. We're looking at things like firmness and pain and, and redness. Um, if they're breastfeeding, if they have good lactation, those kind of things. The most important assessment that you're going to do on a postpartum patient is her uterus. Why? Why do you think? Yes, very good. Hemorrhage. And the postpartum woman, this is most likely the way they're going to die if they die. It's postpartum hemorrhage. It's the number one cause of postpartum mortality. The uterus is super, super important. And that's not something you normally check in other patients, right? So it takes um, a thought process to think about going and checking that. But it is very important that you check it. So I don't expect you, of course, when you go to clinical to be able to find the uterus right away and know exactly what it feels like and know what it's, what it's doing. But you should have an idea if you're looking for the fundus up here, problem. So typically the fundus is going to be around the umbilicus. And it should feel firm, kind of like a fist. And about the size of a fist or about the size of maybe a grapefruit. So you should feel it about here, firm, round. And the first time you feel for it, you're probably going to need some help because you're going to be feeling and then all of a sudden you feel it. So it should be firm. Again, it should be midline. If it's squishy or soft, that's something we call boggy, let your nurse know. If you go to feel that uterus and it feels squishy, they need to know because that means that muscle is not contracting like it should, which means they have a huge risk of hemorrhage um, if they're not hemorrhaging already. So make sure if it's squishy, or it's not in the middle, that you let them know. And then bowel and bladder, we don't check this any different than we check any other patient. We just focus on it a little bit more because a lot of women with postpartum problems, postpartum problems, postpartum assessments um, have problems with bowel and bladder, whether it be constipation, hemorrhoids, urinary retention. There's a lot of things that often happen with women after they have babies. You're not assessing it any different. You're still asking them if they're voiding, if they're having pain, um, if they're having regular bowel movements, if their heart, you know, that you're still asking the same questions, still doing the same assessment. It's just more of a focus for us. And then the other thing that kind of goes with uterus is lochia. You'll get to know this word. It's a word you may have never heard before, but you'll get to know it. Lochia is that vaginal discharge that you have after having a baby. Starts out as red progresses to white. Um, the important things I want you to know about lochia. Um, when you're assessing lochia, you're going to be assessing color, you're going to be assessing odor, you're going to be assessing amount, and you're going to be assessing clots. So we don't direct, usually unless you have a patient who's really on strict eyes and O's because they're hemorrhaging, you're not going to be measuring directly their output, but you'll be doing pad counts a lot of times. If any of you have had babies, you probably know what I'm talking about. Every time you, you change your pad, you count um, how many pads they go through a day, and you also see how much it is spread. Um, so if they have, the most important thing I can tell you about this, if they saturate a pad in less than an hour, meaning you go to look at their pad and it is covered you need to let your nurse know. Um, now, when we get into this in postpartum and we get into ATI, ATI's definition of 
Hemorrhage is when you saturate a pad in 15 minutes, which um, by definition is 15 minutes. However, we don't want you waiting until 15 minutes to, to let your nurse know. So if they saturate a pad in an hour, let your nurse know so that they know what intervent that they need. They know they know they need to intervene. As far as color, usually it's going to be red to a dark red. Um, it, clots is another thing I want you to look at if you're assessing a, um, a woman's peri pad. Take note if there are any clots and what size they are in relationship to an object. They're the size of a pea or um, the size of a quarter, the size of a golf ball, you know, whatever it be, because um, they're going to want to know that as well. Because um, if they're having a lot large clots, that can be an indication of hemorrhage as well. Um, an odor. Typically, women who are still in the hospital who just had a baby are not going to be having a, a postpartum infection yet. But if you notice an odor, make sure you let your nurse know. And then episiotomy. Do you all know what episiotomy is? Oh, yeah, where they snip you. You don't see it used as much in common practice anymore. Um, episiotomy, though, we use this word to help us remember in the acronym to check their bottom, to check their perineum, um, checking for if they have any like hematomas, bruising, if they have an episiotomy or if they have any tearing, um, what does it look like? Does it look like it's getting infected? That kind of stuff. Your suture's intact if it is has been sutured. So this just helps you to remember to check the perineum. Man, I must be talking real fast. It's only 8.30. I'm sorry. If I need to slow down, please let me know. I'm, I'm, I have problems with that talking too fast. Um, and home and sign. Have, have y'all, any of y'all ever heard of home and sign? I don't blame you if you haven't. We don't typically do home and sign in practice anymore. Uh, but again, it helps us remember in the acronym um, because it used to be something we did. Home and sign is where, let's pretend that's mama's foot and that's her leg, you would push on their foot to see if they would have calf pain. What are they checking for, do you think? Yeah, blood clots, exactly, DVTs. We don't do that anymore, like push, actually push on the foot, because if you push hard enough, you may dislodge that clot and then send it right up onto their lungs. Instead, we tell patients to dorsiflex their foot and see if they have pain. Home and sign helps you remember to check for blood clots. So checking for signs of calf pain, checking for like cough and, and things like that that may indicate a PE um, because they do have a much higher risk of uh, blood clots for several reasons we'll talk about, not only because they're more stationary, but their clotting factors increase during pregnancy as well. So it helps you remember to check for blood clots. And then last thing, emotional status. On Maslow's hierarchy, this is at the top, so not as important, but still important. Um, we want to check and make sure that um, now at this point in the hospital, we're not going to have postpartum depression yet. They may have postpartum blues, for example, um, feelings of sadness and inadequacy and tiredness and all that. Um, also, as part of the emotional assessment, we're checking for bonding and attachment. Are they showing any interest in that baby? Because that can be alarming if they're not. <clears throat> My throat is dry. Any questions on that? And that is definitely something you're just going to be practicing when you're in clinical. You're going to be doing it over and over again, and it'll you'll kind of get used to it. And you'll find the postpartum assessment is really not as different as it's, it feels like it's overwhelming, and it's just vastly different from any other assessment. But a lot of it is the same, just with a few extras. And then one of the big things we're going to talk about when we get to actual postpartum um, in week five is postpartum hemorrhage. It's the number one killer of postpartum women. <laughs> it can happen early, within the first 24 hours, or it can happen late, even after they go home. Again, the most important thing I can tell you right now this early on in this class is if they saturate that pad in an hour or if they're uh, blood clots bigger than golf balls, let your nurse know. Please just let them know. And they'll know what to do. I feel like I got a hair. Sorry. Technical difficulty. And on that. The biggest thing is if you don't know, let somebody know. Ask somebody. All right. 
so newborn lab draws and meds. So there's a couple of labs that they get on every baby. Um, the one that you see over there on the right-hand side is the state labs that we do. So every baby is required by law in all 50 states that babies get tested um, for a newborn screening. And it, it does vary slightly by state, however, how many there are uh, or which specific ones are tested. Um, but usually they're pretty much the same. I believe Virginia is 22, 22 things that we test for. And these are genetic defects. And the reason they specifically pick these ones that get done on the newborn screening is <laughs> a lot of times it is defects that from an outside standpoint, you wouldn't know the baby has until they get later or older and then the damage has already been done. For example, PKU. I know y'all have talked about that in lifespan and all. With phenylketonuria or PKU, you're not going to be able to look at a baby until they have it. But if they're ingesting protein, then they can get um, cognitive impairment. And then by the time you know they have it because of the cognitive impairment, it's too late. So if you can recognize it through a blood test that they have it and avoid the, the problem, then you can prevent them from having complications. Sickle cell. Sickle cell is one of those that's tested on that because as a baby, you're not going to be able to tell that they have sickle cell. They're not having crises as a baby usually. Um, time you find out they have it, then it's caused a lot more significant damage. So the newborn screening test they do in every baby, it's required by law. Um, and the cards often look like that. There's a piece of the card where you fill in all the information. And then you put drops of blood in the circles. So you may get to participate in that if you can't do it, because they usually are very picky about those because the cards are kind of expensive and you have to do it just right where you fill in the circle all the way, but you don't overfill it. And But hopefully you'll at least be able to see that. Oftentimes they will use or do, I'm sorry, a glucose testing, especially on your diabetic, your mothers that are diabetic that have babies because they have a risk of dropping their blood sugar from being exposed to mom's higher, um, higher uh, glucose levels. They may do a CBC, depending on what's going on with the baby. They may not, but that newborn screening, always do. And then there's three medicate. Oh, let me show you the foot, too, how to draw. So baby's foot. When you're holding baby's foot, if you do draw labs, this is very similar to when a finger stick. Where do you stick on a finger? On the side, right? Same thing with a foot. When you're sticking a foot, you do it on the side. You don't want to do it directly in the heel pad because you're not going to get good contact. Let's see if I can hold this up in front of us. Here we go. I'm having trouble finding my camera here. There we go. I don't know if y'all can see that where it says yes and no. Um, see it. Good. We still do it the same way. We still wipe with alcohol, let it dry, you know, take a drop of blood, wipe it off. It's no different than a finger stick. You're just using a different body part. Um, typically, when we hold feet, hold it, like put your hand across their foot and kind of don't bend it back this far. But you, you bend the foot back a little bit and that helps you also use your fingers to kind of squeeze the blood. Um, I will tell you the first time, uh, let me pull it over here so y'all can see. So when you're holding it, you hold it like across the bottom of the foot and just squeeze the foot back. Um, the first time I ever did labs on a baby, I was a nursing student. 45 minutes after playing with this foot that I had no idea what I was doing and this poor kid was screaming. The nurse was finally like, here, let me show you how to do it. And I'm like, really <laughs> so um you hold it like that and that helps you give finger control too to squeeze um now the the lancets are a little bit bigger i don't know if y'all have ever seen a heel lancet it doesn't have just the point like a finger stick it's actually a blade it's usually about three two to three millimeters wide long so it leaves a pretty significant little mark Good way to get babies to bleed using heel warmers. I don't know if you've ever seen these. These are one of the best inventions ever. So this one's already been broken, so I can't show you that. But usually it'll have like a powder in the top and a clear liquid in the bottom. You squeeze it really hard and you'll hear it pop where this it breaks that barrier and then you shake it up. 
and you put it on their foot usually for about 10 or 15 minutes and it helps the circulation. These are good for adults as well. So three medications that every baby gets, all of them. We give erythromycin in the eyes. I'm sorry, oh, listen to me, ophthalmic. Anybody know why? Yes, very good, infection. So specifically, something we'll talk about next week, chlamydia and gonorrhea. Because the most common symptoms of chlamydia and gonorrhea are no symptoms at all. So women may have chlamydia or gonorrhea, not realize they have it as baby passes through birth canal, they pick it up in their eyes, they get neonatal conjunctivitis and they go blind. Terrible way to go blind. So now by law, we give every baby erythromycin eye gel. Um, it's cheap, it's easy to administer, and it's far better than possibly missing infection that could cause blindness. Another medication that every baby gets is vitamin K. Why? Yes, very good. Vitamin K is for clotting. So Babies, when they're born, aren't producing vitamin K yet for a few weeks because it's even though vitamin K is produced by the liver, you need bacteria in your gut to stimulate the liver to produce vitamin K. So because the gut is still sterile until they take food in for a little bit, the liver's not working yet. So does it mean that if a baby doesn't get the vitamin K injection, they're going to bleed out? Not necessarily but it does increase the risk, especially if you have a child where you're doing any procedures on, like for instance, doctors will not do a circumcision if you refuse the vitamin K injection for obvious reasons, it increases their risk of bleeding. Now the one that I guess is required because it's a vaccine, but I mean, people refuse them all the time is your hep B vaccine. Um, this one does require separate consent, just like you normally do with vaccinations. The vitamin K and the hepatitis B are both put in the vastus lateralis. I know a lot of times you've probably seen babies, any of you that have babies, where do you a lot of times see them put those injections? On the front, right? Wrong, wrong. It's supposed to go on the side. Um, now the, the lateralis does wrap around the front. So there is muscle there. The problem is it's very thin where it wraps around the front. So the chance of missing that muscle is a lot greater than if you do it on the side in between. So if you're doing these injections, they need to go on the side of the thigh. And then erythromycin, you do a strip of the gel across each eye. Any questions? Nothing. All right, so newborn baths and swaddling. I will tell you, if you don't have experience with swaddling, it takes practice. If you get the chance, practice. And I will tell you also, babies like this that are mannequins are very different than real babies. Real babies are like octopi, octopuses, whatever you want to call them. They will find ways to pop out all of those extremities, although newborns aren't so bad. So when you're swaddling, so you got baby, oh, there's baby. Hold up your blanket, hold it up, and fold down a quarter. You basically have your blanket with one folded corner. I'm trying to find my camera. Ha ha, there it is. And you lay your blanket out. Probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you about swaddling is watch out for the neck. Don't put it up here. Angle them. Put it at the level of the shoulders so that way you're not. Fold one side over like this. Actually, I'm going to try and do this this way. Let's see how well this goes. Maybe I can do it over here. Ha. All right. So we got baby. We got our blanket. Take one side. Fold it across baby. Not around their neck. Bottom. Fold it up. 
If it's too long, you can kind of fold it over. Now you got your feet. You take the other side, turn it around, wrap it around, and now baby's a nicely wrapped burrito. They love it. Again, it takes practice, I understand. But a well-swaddled baby loves it. But the most important thing is when you're swaddling babies, watch out for that neck. Make sure you're not wrapping it. Because a lot of times babies, especially preemie babies, really like to be wrapped tight. They're used to being in the womb where they're used to being like this. So be wrapping them up tight comforts them. But if you're going to wrap them tight, it's okay around their shoulders. Just make sure you're avoiding that neck. As far as bathing them, so baths are often delayed now. Sometimes as long as 24 hours, but usually only by a couple hours. Because they found that the vernix, that cheesy covering that babies are born with, is actually a very good skin conditioner. It's nature's moisturizer. Um, but if you are doing ba baths with babies, there's a few important things I want you to know. One, temperature is absolutely important that you are checking their temperature before you give them a bath and after you give them a bath. If they are less than 97.9 axillary, that's an important number for you to know. If they are less than 97.9 degrees Fahrenheit axillary, you do not give them a bath. Let your nurse know. Swaddle them up, wrap them up, put a hat on them, and let your nurse know. Not bathe them. Um, something we will talk about when we get to newborns in week six is something called cold stress. In newborns, it's not just about being uncomfortable when it comes to being cold. You can give them physical complications. They can get respiratory distress, hypoglycemia, among other things, if they get too cold. So it's really important. Do not bathe them if they are too cold. Another thing. You are probably going to see nurses when they are giving their babies a bath, hanging baby over the sink like this to wash their hair. You probably do it at home if you've had babies. You are not allowed to do that. I know the nurses do it, but they're used to it. Have you ever had a wet baby? They get slick. So for you, if you're doing a bath, they need to be on a stable, solid surface, either in a bassinet, and you can just line it with chucks really good, and then you get them wet and you take the chucks out. Or you can put them even better. The best way to bathe the baby is on one of those radiant warmers, you know, the warming tables where it's got the light over it that keeps them warm. That's really the best way because that keeps them from getting chilled while um, you're doing the bath. Be on a stable, flat, solid surface where they're not going to slip out of your hand when it comes to you. Now, you'll see nurses doing it over the sink. But you need to have them laying on something. Um, in the hospital with newborns, we don't use regular uh, washcloths. You'll see these disposable ones. Um, they may be white, or you may even see them that they're blue. So make sure you use these. Kind of the same thing way you teach and fund or learn in fundamentals. You use a washcloth for each body part. And you'll often have two basins, one with soap and one with just uh, clean water. The first thing you're going to do is the face with soap. Soap free. I'm not talking about the hair. The hair you will use soap in, especially because it'll have probably um, vaginal secretions and vernix and all kinds of stuff in it. But the face, especially around the eyes, don't use any soap. Just straight water. Questions on that? As far as diapering, um, most of your diapers are not... Um, most of them, but your preemie diapers, see if I can show that, have this little cutout, on the top. If you, uh, not preemie, um, newborn and preemie diapers, they have this little cutout on the top to, so that you're not covering the umbilical cord. So make sure the umbilical cord is not covered when you're putting it on. If you have a super tiny baby, just fold it up, fold it down. Or if you got a big baby where they got to start out with a size one, <laughs> it does happen. Um, you can just fold it down. And that way it's below the umbilicus. Just make sure you're not covering that umbilicus because it needs to be out to air. As far as cleaning the umbilicus, it used to be years ago we used rubbing alcohol around it. Um, the problem with rubbing alcohol, it's great. It does help dry it out. The problem is it also causes cracks in the skin because it dries it out and actually increases risk of infection. Ironic, isn't it? We don't use alcohol anymore. We just keep the site dry. Um, we usually just use plain water. Um, if uh, the umbilicus gets soiled, like with stool or urine or something, then you might use like a baby wipe or soap, but don't use any rubbing alcohol. 
keep it exposed and dry. Um, there will be a clamp. I'll throw it in here. Um, in the umbilicus, there will be a clamp on there usually, and they'll take that off before they leave. Um, but that is to keep to stop the blood flow when baby's born. So just leave that clamp on. The nurse tells you to take it off. Um, circumcisions. So the circumcision is care is going to depend on the type of circumcision that was done. I believe at Henrico Doctors they do something called a GOMCO procedure, which is where they basically take this divider and put it in between the penis and the foreskin and take a scalpel and cut the skin off. Um, there's another one called a plastibel where it's almost like this clamp clamps down onto the foreskin and essentially cuts off circulation so it falls off later on when they're at home. So it depends on which procedure they're doing, whether you do Vaseline or not. So find out from your nurse. Usually the GOMCO, you do use Vaseline. The Plastibel, you don't. Um, but they'll let you know whether to do that. But a big thing with circumcision, keeping it dry, keeping it clean. If you see any serous crusting like scabbing, do not pick it off. And make sure the parents know do not pick it off because that's the body's way of healing. If you see bleeding, excessive bleeding, of course, let your nurse know. A few drops of blood after circumcision is totally normal and expected, even when they go home. The biggest thing that you're going to need to observe in a circumcised baby, make sure if you see them pee. If they void, the nurse needs to know because that's one of the big criteria for discharge after a circumcision is that they, ha they have to pee first because you want to make sure they don't have an obstruction. Any questions? And then last thing, newborn assessment. Again, I'm not going into a detailed assessment too much with you. Um, one of the things that you're going to see done um, when babies are born is called an APGAR score. And we're not going to go into the details of the APGAR score right now. Uh, but an APGAR score gives you an idea at one minute and five minutes after birth. How is baby doing? How are they ad adapting? So are they breathing well? Is their heart beating fast enough? What's their color? Um, are they moving around? Those kind of things, responding to stimuli. Versus are they floppy like a limp dish rag and blue? Yeah, one minute and five minutes. So they'll do, they'll do it twice, minimum. So they'll do it at one minute, and then they'll do it again at five minutes. Now, if the scores aren't very good, they can do it more. But minimum, they'll do it at one minute and five minutes. And then when we get to newborns, which will be a while, we'll talk about the specifics of what each category is. But for now, that just lets you know when they're talking about, oh, baby has an APGAR of eight. I know what that means. So APGARs, um, seven and up, seven to 10 is good. That means they're adapting well, they're responding well, they got good color, they're breathing. If you hear, oh, baby has an APGAR of five, you know, oh, no not good so not so much now that you understand how to analyze it but more that you you know what that that scale means I'm sorry um yes um as far as newborn heart and lung sounds, I can get this to work. It didn't work. I want you to hear how fast a newborn's heart rate sounds. And if you're, when you're in clinical, I want you to sit there and listen to a newborn heart because it takes practice counting a heartbeat. And you will still take your, your stethoscope to clinical for OB because you'll need it for mom. But for the babies, they will have their own. Could you see how tiny that thing is? Oh, it's so cute. Let me see. Haha. <laughs> Tiny. Um, and if you put an adult stethoscope on a baby's chest, you're going to take over their whole chest. Kind of goes with the blood pressure thought. This isn't, this is actually not even the smallest one. How cute is that? It's adorable. So let's see if I can get this to work so you can hear how fast it sounds. And ladies on the computer, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it. You know what I just thought about? I don't think this computer has, oh, there should be something through there. Though. 
Don't pay attention to the information on the screen because some of it's not accurate, but. I know it's hard to hear. fast and that's the part that's inaccurate that I do not want you to pay attention to on that it's telling you that um oh, sorry ladies I just dropped y'all um it's telling you on the screen that you can um count the heart rate for 10 seconds and multiply by six do not absolutely not not in a baby. I know an adult sometimes, especially heart rate, respiratory rate, if they're not on meds like the Joxin, we may count for 15 seconds and multiply by four or something like that. But in babies, absolutely, you have to ch listen for a full minute um, for heart rate and um, lung sounds. So two minutes, basically a minute for each because their heart rate and their respiratory rate are irregular. If you've ever listened to a baby breathe, they'll pant. <laughs> And then they'll stop breathing for a few seconds. That's normal. That is totally a normal newborn breathing pattern. But if you only count for 15 seconds, you may get a vastly different respiratory rate than you would if you counted for a full minute. So in babies, always a full minute. Because it can change. Any questions? All right. So let's talk about your dosage calculation you'll be taking today. You're excited. <laughs> Me too. So hopefully all of you reviewed, um, did the practice questions, did the ATI um, assignment. Um, as far as for PNs on the ATI assignment, y'all did the dosages by weight. So things like milligrams per kilogram or therapeutic range. And we'll go over a couple too to make sure y'all are okay. Um, and then um, for the ADNs, y'all had... The pediatric medications, which also had the dosages by weight, the weight-based dosing. Um, it had maintenance fluid calculations. Um, and it also had body surface area, but don't worry about the body surface area, the one where you multiply the height times the weight, divide about 3,600 square root, all that stuff. Hopefully you have no idea what I'm talking about because you didn't look at it. <laughs> we'll talk about that later when we get to pediatrics, but it, that's not on today. So... Um, far as your dosage calculation, um, same as always, you get three attempts. So you'll take your first one today. Um, if you're not successful, then please let me know. Um, and either, either I can meet with you today or meet with you next week or um, something like that. And we can kind of go over it before you take your second one. You need a 90%. So you need to get 18 out of 20 correct in order to be successful. Um, I highly, highly recommend that you do this by the 19th. Is that Tuesday? That Tuesday after the second week of class. I believe it's the 19th. Um, that is add drop, which means if you were by chance not successful after all three attempts, you could drop the course without any penalty, without a failing grade, and without having to pay for the course. So I highly recommend that you do all three attempts prior to that. Just one, then you can get it out of the way to if you needed to you'd be able to drop the course um so the good thing about us having pre-semester a little bit earlier usually we have it next tuesday but we switched returning student and new student um gives you a few extra days where you could get all three attempts in if you needed to so after you take each attempt um and again i know y'all won't have access to blackboard yet but once you gain access to blackboard Upload your results. To, there will be a spot for dosage calculations. Um, you'll upload your results so that way we have that document in there showing what grade you received. Um, there's technical requirements and supplies. If you don't have a laptop with you, better go get one before your dosage calculation. You'll need it for that. Um, it will be taken on ATI. So it's not an ATI created test. It's one I've created but entered into ATI. For my exams, I know some of y'all I think Miss Ingress uses ATI too, doesn't she? Or does she use, I mean Blackboard. Does she use Blackboard 8? 
Blackboard. Um, I use ATI for all of my exams, um, so that might be a little bit different. Students have told me they like ATI better once they've gotten then into using them. I feel like it's easier to read um, and maneuver. So this will still be as if I handed you a paper exam. It's still the same type of format the exams I've entered into ATI, so it's not where you're taking a proctored exam every week uh, or every um, time we take a test, but um, it's on the ATI platform instead of the Blackboard platform. Um, there is the calculator that's built into ATI. So when you take your dosage count today, you'll use the calculator built into the ATI program. Um, you'll be provided with a pencil and scratch paper, just like we normally do. So that way, if you need to write anything or, or writing out your calculations and things like that. <laughs> um, biggest thing I can tell you is take your time. I know it seems like, oh my gosh, I only have three minutes per question. That's not enough time. It is. Um, read the question. Um, if you're having trouble with one, do the question three times. Figure it up three times. If you get the same answer twice, then more than likely that's where you want to go. Um, and I'll go over a couple of them. Yes. Thought I heard a oh, sorry. Thought I heard a question. Before I go over a couple of them, I'm going to show you Blackboard. And I know y'all don't have access to Blackboard yet. But the, when you do, you'll be able to find everything. And so that sheet I have um, on the front where it gives you the layout to find everything, that will help as well. Let's see if the link is actually going to take me where I want it to. No, denied. That's okay. We'll do it this way. All right. So this is just one of the examples. Um, so some of the things that you'll see, introduction, you'll have an introduction folder, and this is where you're going to find a lot of your introductory documents. Supplemental syllabus, syllabus will be here, your tracking calendar. Those are two big important ones you make sure you want to read. Um, on your supplemental syllabus at the end of it is going to be that form that you sign, and then you'll end up uploading saying, yes, I read it, etc. Tracking calendar has all your dates of what we're covering, when your readings are, um, homework that's due, very important. Your program handbook that you'll need for any information. Um, and then I have a few folders to help you. This is a math folder, and it has, um, for instance, the formulas I sent y'all, um, the, the information and practice, the same one I put on your announcement semester in your classes. That's it. A couple of videos, um, maintenance, fluids. Um, oh, gosh, my throat is dry. I promise I don't have the COVID. Um, so maintenance fluids, I know for ADNs, y'all will worry about that today. For PNs, y'all won't worry about that till later. <coughs> but it's there. Um, ATI proctored exam. So there's a few things here that will help you. The cut scores are here. So if we're getting ready to take our proctored exam, and you want to know what a level two or level three is, you can find it there. Um, we do have two proctored exams in both of these courses. Um, which can actually be a benefit. So we take a maternal newborn proctored exam about midway through, and then we take the peds one at the end. And the good thing is they still weigh 35 points total. Give me a second. I'm going to go get me a drink or I'm going to die. You see, I'm crying.
<laughs> All right, sorry about that. And I'll stop coughing. All right, a couple other things that are up here. Some people have found these helpful. Some people have not. There's a maternal newborn one and a nursing care of children one. And these are documents. Uh oh. Okay, that are almost like a condensed version of your ATI book. It's just an outline. Sometimes people find it beneficial. Um, and at the end, it's got uh, tips for learning different topics. Use them if they help you, but you don't have to. And then here is something that ATI puts out of how to do a focus review that might help you. There's even a, a worksheet here. If you want to do your focus reviews this way, when y'all do your practice tests A and Bs, um, you do, you know, three points for each topic that you missed. So this might be a way if you wanted to use that sheet to do it, or if you just want to do it in a notebook, either way. But it's an option. Not required to put it on there, though. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me go back to that. Okay, so normally y'all's proctored exam is 35 points, right? 35 exam points. Good thing about this proctor in this class, it's still worth 35 points, but still total. So each test is worth 17 and a half points. So in other words, if you don't do as hot on one test, it doesn't have as great of an impact on your grade as like when you only have one proctored exam. Makes sense. So it's still 35 points total of your exam grade, but it's just broken up into two different proctored exams. But that's not going to happen because y'all are going to pass both of them. I'm sorry. No. Um, the, uh, the ADN is easy because it's the same. The ADN, it's 70 questions on both. Kian, the maternal newborn is 60 questions and the Nursing care children, I believe, is 70 questions. Is it what? I'm sorry. Yeah. So basically, your, your maternal newborn would be 50 questions that count and then but 60 questions total. There's always going to be like data questions as they update. Even your NCLEX, you're going to have questions that you're, you're going to answer that don't count. And you're not going to know which ones they are. But that way they know when you take your NCLEX, these are questions that have been tested and you're not just taking questions that might not be valid questions. <clears throat> so then another thing I have here, studying critical thinking skills. There's a list of NCLEX strategies, things that NCLEX uses, and we'll talk about some of these in class to help you analyze and figure out what answers are, are gonna be. For instance, absolute words. If you have something that's an absolute word, like always or never, <laughs> that's not going to be correct. Or a therapeutic commu communication technique. You never want to tell your patient, don't worry. That's, not, that's always going to be a wrong answer. So it's a list of um, techniques. Um, there is also a recorded lecture I have here. It's about 50 minutes, I think, 45, 50 minutes. Um, that just goes through analyzing NCLEX questions, how to break them down, the parts to, to figure out how to um, best answer them. And then this last page right here is the one I printed out for you, that yellow sheet or blue sheet, depending on which color yours is, um, same form. So if you lose it or if you um, just want another copy, it's, it's right here for you. And then another thing I have here is ATI templates. I think the ATI templates are fantastic. In fact, when we do growth and development, we don't really go over growth and development because y'all have had that in lifespan a lot. <laughs> Uh, but you'll have to kind of go back and review it. So these ATI templates, you can use them for your own study skills. Uh, you can use them for focus reviews. I encourage y'all to use them. Um, so for example, the growth and development one, um, it, I would say use these for like each stage, infant, preschool, et cetera. And then you can write out, for example, the physical development, cognitive development, nutrition, injuries. It gives you kind of all that information and helps you. I'm a visual person. I like my notes to be in some kind of visual per format, like tables and graphs and 
instead of just paragraphs. So if that's how you like to see your notes and you like to put it on things like this, these would probably be beneficial for you. You can go home and rewrite your notes in a chart form. Um, and the good thing about these, you can type into them as well. So you don't have to handwrite these and print them out. If you're using them for study purposes, you can type them into them as well. Um, like for instance, um, a medicate, you probably know the medication ones from farm, very similar type of format, um, but it helps you kind of organize your information. If you're the type like me that likes your information organized in some kind of visual format, these would probably be very beneficial for you. And then some of the other stuff, there's a big list of medical terminology. It's like 26 pages. I do not want you to memorize it, <laughs> but it's a good reference. Um, document it has all your like prefixes and suffixes and um if you can break down a word oftentimes you can figure out what it means even if you don't directly know what the word means um if it'll open it's big you need to memorize it it's just a reference <laughs> so for instance it tells you the affix like a we know means without and it'll give you examples and you can even click on it and it'll take you to um like, for instance, analgesic, if we click on analgesic. It'll take you to, like, a Wikipedia or other reference point to, to talk, talk to you about the word. So it's a good reference. It is certainly not something I want you to memorize. God knows. But if you're wondering what a prefix or suffix, yeah, it's 25 pages. <coughs> um, prefixes, suffixes, things like that. Just something to go back to. And you have access to your Blackboard courses for two years. So even after you've graduated, you can always come back and use it. Um, some of the things that, quite honestly, you're probably never going to read, but it's there if you want it. <laughs> um, the test plan, the, the NCSBN, which is the, the people who write the NCLEX, the test plan, people will use this as basically a study guide to help them with the NCLEX. It, it breaks down the topics and stuff like that. Um, a and a code of ethics, et cetera, and so forth. I know those are things y'all are probably never going to look at, but they're there if you want them. So that's an important tab with a lot of things. And the other most important tab you're going to have, it says weekly content. So each week I'm going to have information up um, that I highly recommend that you look at. For instance, pre-semester. Um, all the things that I'm going to show you in just a second, different pages are here. So the PowerPoint I just showed you is here. The MIU introductory packet, it, it's pretty big. Um, for PNs, y'all don't have to worry about this one because, well, you can look at it because it has some diagrams and some like um, pictures and stuff to help you remember information. But the first page is information about the mother infant unit at Forest. So like door codes and things like that, phone numbers. <clears throat> so for ADNs, that'll really help you, especially in the front. And some of the information that's towards the back will help you as well. Um, there's a list of OB terms and abbreviations. So this will help you with the most common ones that you'll see. I recommend these two, the OB terms and abbreviations and the common OB meds. Print those and take them to clinical with you. Because those will help you when you're reading a chart, for example, and you come across a word and you don't know what it means. This may help you figure it out or you see an abbreviation. We love abbreviations in OB. Oh my gosh, you thought med surge was bad? Just wait. Common OB meds. This is helpful. Um, and a lot of these are probably medications that you've at least heard of or might even know well. Um, and it's broken up by antepartum, which is pregnancy, intrapartum, which is during labor and delivery, postpartum, which is afterbirth, and then newborn. So you'll be able to see some of the more common meds that you may come across. <laughs> Let's say print both of those and take them to clinical as a reference. Um, there is a sheet here with a bubble he assessment. So that postpartum assessment I went through, it kind of breaks down the different parts, some of the things you're looking for. Um, an example of an APGAR assessment showing you the breakdown if you wanted to have um, a printout of that. <clears throat> and then things about fetal heart rate, um, how to interpret fetal heart rate. That will become really beneficial in a couple weeks when we talk about that in more detail. But for now, um, we're just really focusing on if you see any drops. And then postpartum hemorrhage. If they if they are having it if they are saturating a pad an hour or their uterus feels soft, then you need to let your nurse know. <clears throat> and then I have the same thing for each week. So week one, for example, we're talking about reproductive disorders, STIs, contraceptives, things like that. And this is the stuff I already sent to y'all in that announcement. 
Um, so every week I'll have like key terms. Some of it's going to be words that are brand new. Some of it's going to be words that you know. It just gives you an idea. If you, if you don't know what the words mean, you can't answer the questions. The PowerPoint will be here. Um, sometimes there may be extra things like, for instance, I sent y'all an STD and um, contraceptive fill-in chart. Again, it's not something that's required. It's not an assignment. But if you like to put your notes in that visual chart, this is something that you can use. And then there are some weeks, not every week, I have pre-recorded lectures on YouTube. Um, so my YouTube name is Amy Martinez RN. Um, it's like a purple A, I think, for my picture because I've never put a picture up um, but if you click on these links it'll take you right to it and then you can subscribe so you can find all of them there's previous um, recordings of uh, tutorings on there um, and various different things so some weeks we'll have pre-recorded lectures where we'll just then end up doing activities um, some weeks it'll be pre-recorded and we'll we'll go over it um, so it just depends week to week. Not every week has a pre-recorded. I do recommend that you bring a recorder to class. You're welcome to record classes if you wish. I know not everybody does, but you are welcome either on your phone or a recording device. <clears throat> Sometimes phones can act a little wonky. I think they're better than they used to be, but I know I used to when I went to school, my phone would cut off after like 20 minutes, which was not beneficial. Um, so um, it, they usually have little recording devices, too, for like 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, but you, you're welcome to use your phone as well if, if you find you get consistent um, coverage with that. I'll have, like, right now I have the first four weeks up because that leads up to our first exam. And I'll do it by exam. So after we take our first exam, then I'll load weeks five through eight because that will be leading up to our second exam. Under each exam week. And again, this is optional. This is not required. It is up to you whether you choose to do it. And our each week is going to be exam objectives. So these are topics. You can use, use them when you're going back and reviewing your lectures. Use them when you're doing your readings. Um, describe changes of puberty in females, for example. So it gives you some of those objectives to help you reiterate that information for that exam. And those are found specifically under that week content. Now, where you're going to be uploading documents, um, you'll find here. And I know I have a whole lot more tabs than y'all do. Don't panic. Um, there's one for dosage calculation. So when you take your dosage calculation, you'll then upload your report from Blackboard for each one. And if you only take one, then you only need to upload one report. And then you'll have one for exam remediation. So after each exam, <clears throat> if you got a score of less than 80, you have to do exam remediation, upload it there. Homework, quizzes. So for next week, God bless, your quiz for the first week is to upload your signed supplemental syllabus form. So the link will be there. And then we'll have any other quizzes that we have. Um, God bless, acting up. Hold on. This is what I want. Um, weekly quizzes so anytime we don't have an exam other than the first week um, we will have a quiz at the beginning of class so be on time ready to begin it opens at the start of class and closes five minutes after class starts at least to start it usually they're going to be 10 minutes in length questions typically um, and those will actually be on blackboard instead of ati so when you come in have your blackboard open and it'll unlock at the start of class time so we can get those started Any questions? I know I have a lot of stuff on Blackboard. All right. Of course, the biggest thing I can tell you is prepare. Do not wait until the last minute to do things because inevitably that is when something happens. So you must be prepared. Um, do your homework every week. If you miss one homework assignment, that's not going to hurt you. But if you consistently miss homework or late to class, not doing what you need to do, um, it kind of sets you up for failure. <clears throat> Any questions? All right. Let's talk about a couple of math. Yay! Of course, a P's nurse would have cartoons. It's required. All right. So let's pull up. 
specifically the ones I'll pull this up. So this is the sheet y'all should have had. Turn the light on. So I'll talk about the therapeutic dosing or um, yeah, therapeutic range. Make sure y'all understand that one. That one sometimes people struggle with. All right, y'all are going for a ride. Okay. So question number one. And I would say on your scratch paper, if it's easier than trying to read this problem, bullet points. For example, doctor orders 1,200 milligrams. Make sure that's a little bit better. All right, so we have 1200 milligrams ordered, 140 pounds. Our range was it 75 to 150? kilogram per day. So we want to know, our question is, is there a dose, an appropriate dose? Is it okay? Does it fall in that range? Safe dose. Because <clears throat> if it's too low, if it's below this, it's not enough. It's not effective. If it's above, above this, then it's toxic. Thing we want to figure out, hold on. Um, hours. Because this gives us how much they're getting per dose, and this gives us how much they're getting per day, right? So we need to, the biggest thing that people usually have trouble with is making these match. For instance, if this said they were getting 1,200 milligrams per day, that matches. But they don't match because they're getting 1,200 milligrams per dose, right? So how much is this patient getting per day? Very good. Now they match. 4,800 milligrams per day. And they're supposed to get 75 to 150 mg per kg per day. So our units match. They're both in day. So we need to figure out, based on 75 to 150, how much is this patient supposed to get? So first, we got to figure out what their weight is. in kilos because everything is done in kilos when you see pounds you should first think why is it in pounds yes correct mm -mm. not now they might say it on the paper because face saving purposes but if you figure it out they're not rounded till the end example. Hold on. Yeah, I just, for spacing purposes, I shortened it there, but. Oh, pfft. whoops. I see what you mean. Okay, so 140. A 2.2. Right? You leave that in your calculator. So leave that in your calculator. Multiply that by 75. Oops. Ah. 4,000, not 4, not 7. That 
is that that when you multiply by the 75, the minimum amount that patient should receive. God, yes, what is wrong with my alphabet today? Minimum per day, right? So to figure out the maximum, they should get no more than we use this top number and do the same thing. So we take that 63.3 and leave it in our calculator, multiply by 150. And five four five point four five four five. So get no more than nine thousand four hundred and forty five point et cetera a day. And they should get no less than four thousand seven hundred and seventy two per day. So basically you're looking for does the patient's order dose fall where in between these two numbers. In this case, does it fall in between those two numbers? So what are you going to put on your answer line? Yes. Yes, you are correct. So let's say for, ex let's change this and say that the patient's dose was 4,000 milligrams per day. That would be a no because it's less than that minimum. So their dose is up here. It's not in between the minimum and the maximum. And if you want, draw a number line. If, if you like, if you're a visual person, draw a number line where you put like your 4772 here and then your max is 9545. And then you can figure out, well, where's my dose? If your dose is over here, like if it was 4,000, that's a no, right? But our dose is right here. So is it on the number line? Yes. Does that make sense? So usually the biggest thing that people mess up on is making sure these match. This is per dose, the 1,200. Make it per day because in this we're looking for per day. If this said, let's change a little bit and let's say instead of milligrams per kilogram per day they were supposed to get 75 milligrams per kilogram per dose then this q6 wouldn't matter we're just going to compare the 1200 Does that makes sense we're just looking for one time they get that medicine 75 to 150 milligrams per kilogram does that make sense the do per dose versus per day <clears throat> Were there any other ones that y'all had difficulty with you wanted me to talk about? What's that? Yep, that's exactly it. So if we look at number three. We have a patient weighing 27 pounds. We're getting 500 milligrams of vancomycin every six hours for fever. State pediatric dose is 25 milligrams per kilogram per dose. And then it tells us the concentration. And this one I know has a lot of steps and it won't be that complicated, I promise. <laughs> I tried to make these more complicated. Um, but it's basically the same thing you've done before. You figure out the dose first. And then you bring out based on that, you use the desired over have to figure out your volume. So in this case, yes. Now, this isn't a range question. It's just asking you what would their dose be? No. Yeah, range question. Right. And that's where I want to make sure y'all understand what the question And I would recommend go to the end of your question and look at the question first. For example, this question wants to know how many milliliters would the patient receive per dose ordered? So since we want to know dose ordered, we just need that 500 milligrams. We don't really care what they need per weight. Does that make sense? Now, if it asked you, is this an appropriate dose? Yeah, we would need that. So based on po dose ordered, so let's go through. We have 27 pounds. 
and they're getting 500 milligrams of vinc every six hours. And your standard dose is Two thousand milligrams per liter. And what our question wants to know per dose ordered. So when you see dose ordered, you want to know based on what the physician actually when you go and read your chart and it's ordered five hundred milligrams. Now, you're going to look it up and make sure it's an appropriate dose, but in this question right here, all you want to know is based on 500 milligrams, how many mLs is this patient going to get? So this, for this purpose, who cares? We want to know this. So we just want to know, based on the dose ordered, how many milliliters are they going to get? So we take our 500 milligrams, divide it by... 2,000 milligrams desired over half times 1,000 milliliters. Do any of y'all do dimensional analysis? You do? Okay, well, let's do a dimensional too. Okay, so if you're doing dimensional, so you start out with whatever's ordered. And then you're going to multiply by your next, but you want to flip it so that your units are opposite. So in this case, our 2,000 milligrams has to be down here because our milligrams are on top. And this is per one liter. So that gets rid of our milligrams. So now we have 500 times one over 2,000. So then to convert our liters to milliliters, we put our liter on bottom. And that gets rid of our liters. And multiply across. So uh, basically 500,000 divided by 2,000 dose. Then divide it out. That gives us 250 milliliters per dose. And if you don't want to use dimensional, just block that out. Pretend you never saw that. It's okay. Everybody has different ways of doing math, and that's okay. Do it the way that it works for you. That's the biggest thing I will say with math. Don't try to learn a new way just because you need to learn a new way. As long as it's safe and it consistently gives you the correct answer, that's what matters. I've had to tell me, I have my own way of doing this. I can't tell you, I can't describe it to you, but I do it my own way and it works every time. If it works every time, that's, that's really all that matters. That's what's going to make your patient safe is that you're using something you're familiar with, not where you're trying to do it a different way. So I'll show you different ways. If this bugs you, don't use it. If this bugs you, don't use it. Do whatever works for you. Some people really like this because it's more simplified, but some people really like this because they're able to see every step and they're able to mark out their, their units and it helps them outline which units, um, if they have things lined up correctly. Do you? Let's see. See if there's any other. How many milligrams are in a grain? Cool. Just saying. 
let's see. Oh, when you're doing um, like infusion questions and it's not over a full hour, a couple ways you can do this. For instance, it's ranitidine. You have 50 milligrams. I'll show you how to do this both ways because sometimes if people are trying to do it by the portion of the hour, it mixes them up. 200 mLs. We're giving it over 15 minutes. So the formula method, you can do this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah, I didn't need the 50 milligrams. That's why I was like, wait a minute. So all we need in this case is volume and time. So 200 milliliters over 0 0.25 hours because 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour. Or a lot of times, especially when you're doing conversions, another way you can do it that helps you remember if you're supposed to divide over 15 minutes times your conversion. In this case, there's 60 minutes in one hour. So whichever way works better for you. Some people like it where they just like to do it in their head and figure out what portion of an hour it is. Some people actually like to write it out and see. Again, whichever fits for you. You can do it. I like number 15 because it has tons of conversions and people are like, oh my God, it's so hard. And I'm like, I promise it's not, it's fundamentals. I like it. So number 15, we're given Keflex or Cephalexin, 250 milligrams. We have a one gram vial. In a two ounce bottle. And we want to know eight teaspoons. Lots of conversions. Now, I will tell you a lot of times that's where people mess up on dosage calculations. They've worked really hard to learn the formulas and how to work them out. And then they mess up on conversions. Teaspoons and tablespoons seems to be the most common one. How many milliliters in teaspoon? Tablespoon. Very good. So in this case, I'll show you two ways to do it. So if we're doing the 250 milligrams divided by if you convert it in your head, a thousand milligrams times um, two ounces is how many mLs? Very good. 60 mLs. Sometimes people like to take it all the way down to the milliliter and then bring it up to what they need. So 250, whoops, 50. So that ends up giving us 15 mLs, which is how many teaspoons? Three, not two, three. Three. Or, and this is a way that dimensional helps people sometimes. Or you may look at it and be like, oh, no, that is too much of a cluster for me. And, um, 1,000 milligrams per one gram times um, let's see, one ounce in Shit. No, I want it the other way. Fifteen. Yeah, two ounce.
I'm not having so much trouble with this. Yeah. Well, we got to put that part in too. Hold on. Did I? I can't remember which way to put this. Oh my God. My brain's just not working well. Yeah, the two ounce per gram. That's what it is. Because that's our concentration. We have one gram and a two ounce. Then we're doing our conversion. Times um, teaspoon of mLs. And if you look at that and you say, oh, hell no, that's okay. I get it. And that gets rid of your milligrams, your grams, ounces, and your mLs. So you're left with teaspoons per dose. The one thing I do actually like about dimensional is it helps you double check and see if you've gotten what you need. For example, we know we're looking at how many teaspoons per dose. Once you mark out your opposite you can look and see what we have left. We have dose left and we have teaspoons left. Are we looking for teaspoons per dose? Yeah, so that kind of acts as a double check too. If you cross out all your, your units, then you're left with, are the units I'm left with correct or not? Bunch of conversions. Oh, did y'all get that? I'm sorry. I was just gonna start erasing away. All right. I'm as far as, well, not specifically that many conversions in one question, <laughs> uh, but I did that on purpose so that you would say conversions, yes, absolutely. Know your conversions. Because there's probably going to be a conversion in at least every question in some format. And usually teaspoons and tablespoons are the two that people get backwards. But no, not that many in one question. <laughs> I did that on purpose so that you would have to, you know, tell it me. All right. Do y'all, was there any other ones that y'all saw? I want to make sure I give y'all a break before y'all go to your next thing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. On, on here. No, maybe not. Oh, yeah, there is. <clears throat> so reconstitution, a lot of people have, oops, y'all, sorry. A lot of people have trouble with reconstitution because they see this big old word and like, oh my God. When you see reconstitution, think mix. All you're doing is mixing. So that, de that desired over have is very similar. Let's say that we're giving gram of vancomycin ordered. And you have a two gram vial It tells you to reconstitute with 10 mLs, and you want to know how many mLs are you going to get. Basically, after you take your syringe with your saline or water or whatever is in it, you stick it in your dry powder syringe, you push your fluid in, you swirl it around. So you have your two gram vial, you stick 10 mLs in there, you swirl it around. Once it's dissolved, how many mLs are you going to suck back out of that syringe that it, or out of that vial that equals one gram? So in this case, we can desire to over half. So we have one gram ordered that over your two grams and multiply by 10 mLs. So what you should have in your syringe once it's all said and done that you're going to give your patient it's five mLs to be equal to that one gram. Does that make sense? Oh, with. Sorry, old old school nursing shorthand. It's a C with a line over it. 
forget that we don't use handwritten anymore, so nobody knows what those symbols are. It, it's a, you know, I honestly have no idea where it came up with. <laughs> yeah, without his S with a line over it. So, you reconstitute, just think mix. Hey! Who does? Needs me to call her? Okay. It's okay. Uh, all right. I want to make sure y'all get a break. All right, ladies, any questions from the peanut gallery online? So far, so good. Good. Pretty good. All right, ladies, I'm going to let y'all go. Um, please email me if y'all need anything, okay? And to the rest of y'all, same with y'all. Um, if you take your dosage calc, let me know if you need to meet with me. Um, I'll be here until at least six, if not later today. Um, so if you want to meet up and talk about your, go over the results or whatnot, good luck. Um, so you won't, you won't be able to see the actual questions. What will happen when you finish your dosage count, your score will pop up. Um, if you download the report, you know how like when y'all do practice test A and B, you download the report and it tells you, it will tell you the topics of the questions you missed. Like it might tell you that you missed a question on like weight-based dosing or something, um, but it doesn't actually have the answers on there to preserve the integrity of the test. But if you actually wanna see what you, the actual questions and answers were, I can do that with you in person. But we'll tell you the topics of the questions. No, you won't be in here. Um, um, where are y'all? Mm -mm. No, because I have another group coming. Where is my other? I had another form. Did everybody give me back the sign in sheets that they built? Okay, perfect. Um, all right. 